it's shaped like a lady's boot. Here, this is sort of the long boot. This is the heel of the boot, and this is, <coughs> is the foot of the boot, and she's which is known as Sicily. Sort of fun fact. Um, is a and uh, I know you're all second years, so next year you'll be third years, and you'll have the opportunity to compete to go to the Euro Wine Tour. Uh, this year, actually, for the current third years, we're going to be going to New Zealand in March, if all goes well and things. We hope things are returning to normal by March. The reason we're going to New Zealand in March is because that is their harvest time. I always like to go uh, to take the students when it's harvest time. So third years, we'll be going to New Zealand. Um, but for you guys, uh, when you're third year next year in September, October, we will be going back to Europe and we will be going to Italy again. We went to Italy last year. Uh, we're going to be going to Italy. Uh, specifically Piedmont, this area here. And then we're going to go up into France and we're going to visit Burgundy. And again, we discussed Burgundy the last uh, yesterday. Um, so we're going to be going there. So let's see who's going to be the smartest top of the class and is going to make it on the wine tour. But if you do, you're going to be going to Italy and France. So let's see. So let's pay a little extra attention today when we talk about um, paid month because some of those questions might be on the, uh, the test that you have to write in order to make it to the wine tour. Let's see. So I think we have about five, six minutes before we're ready to start, unless you let me know when you want to start, if you want to start earlier. And it was basically, and we'll talk a little bit more about it when we get there, but it was a, a Italian, it was a wine produced in Italy, but primarily with French grapes. It was the most famous uh, Super Tuscan. We visited this particular winery, uh, the Euro Wine Tour um, last year. My question is, what is the name of the region that this winery is placed. It's in Italy, it's in Tuscany, but within Tuscany is a subregion. And what I want to know is what is the name of this subregion that this famous first Super Tuscan was produced? So if you can go to Instagram, LinkedIn, send me a message and answer the question. So let's see if we can find out who's the first student because i'll be able to get the messages by by when they were sent so let's just see that should be interesting to see who can come up with that
Okay, I'm back. Okay, uh, how are we at time? Almost, uh, almost there. I think 10, 10.45 is start time, yeah? Yeah. Okay, we are on time. I think we can start. Yes, 91 students. So what, uh, what campuses do we have today? Avijit sir, unmute yourself. There we go. Yeah, it's only 91 students. Can we start? Very good morning, Mr. Edgar. Good morning, students. Good morning, Pritam. Good morning. Yes, good morning. We have 115 students. Uh, Mr. Edgar, we'll just give one more minute uh, before we start off this session. We'll just try to okay. see. No problem. And for the students that are just that are just joining board now. Okay. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Oh, you've maybe had your second cup of coffee or your second couple of tea by now. You're ready to learn something. Uh, last time we met, we discussed France and um, the diversity of the of the grape varieties in France and the diversity of the styles of wine in France. Um, well, we go across the border from France into Italy. And if you thought there was a lot of wine regions in France, and a lot of grape varieties in France, wait till you get to Italy because Italy is probably the most diverse wine growing country in the world. From the huge amount of grape varieties, they have over 1000 different grape varieties, 20 some different, 20, 20 25 different uh, wine growing regions, all different all producing different styles of wine. Um, it's quite, in fact, Italy is probably the most difficult country in the world if you want to study about these particular wines. So please uh, don't ever specialize on Italy, whatever you do in business, because it's really, really difficult to know all the regions, the sub-regions, the sub-sub-regions, the grape varieties, all that sort of stuff, okay? Stick to India, much easier to figure out there's only what 20 some good wine wineries in India at the moment. So it's much easier to understand. So anyway, I'm kidding. You want to do it, you want to do it. So again, if you look at Italy with this big, beautiful boot, again, it's a boot shaped like a boot kicking the ball, which is Sicily. Um, in Italy, and again, when we looked at France, there were sort of the different wine regions, but they were quite separated. So they weren't sort of side by side by side. They were kind of different areas. But if you see in Italy, it is from the very, very top of the country all the way down to the bottom of the country, there's wine growing regions. It's kind of hard to be driving through Italy and not see a vineyard here. And then you go up a few more miles, you'll see another vineyard there. They really grow grapes everywhere in Italy. Um, so it's kind of a great little country. You can see how it is in comparison to France. It is the oldest home to potentially the oldest wine growing region in the world or, or at least in Europe. Uh, most of the grapes that were, as we learned when we were talking about France, um, the Rhone Valley was a very ancient area for producing wine, but the, those grapes were brought up from, by the Romans. And the Romans obviously uh, are from Italy, from around Rome. So 
Italy is one of the oldest wine producing regions in the world. It is known worldwide for the broad selection of styles, uh, different kinds of wine that they produce there, more uh, variety from Italian wines than any other country in the world. It shares with France the, the title of the largest producer in the world. Um, they both, between the two of them, is about a third each of the amount of wine that's produced in the world. They sort of go back and forth between who's, who's producing the most, depending on the particular weather that happens in each of the different countries. But they're between Italy and France, these are the two largest producers in the world. Um, Italian wines are exported all over the world and extremely popular within Italy as well. In fact, in Italy, it's really, really difficult to sell non-Italian wines in shops and in restaurants. Italy, they like to drink Italian wines. And in Italy, they like to drink wine. They were actually one of the largest uh, consumers of wine per capita. So the amount of bottles per person consumed in Italy is one of the highest in the world. I think it's around 48 to 50 bottles per person per year on average. So that's a huge amount of wine that's being consumed in, uh, in Italy. They really like their wine. It says here, ranked fifth in the world. Again, 56 bottles. Um, again, grapes are grown in almost every region of the country. Uh, and there are more than 1 million vineyards. So 1 million vineyards growing grapes throughout Italy. So it's lots of wine, lots of grapes, lots of production and lots of consumption. Let's look at our map. Again, we have all of the different regions, a million acres of, of grape variety, all the different regions. And we're gonna go through sort of the, the not all of the wine regions in detail, but we're gonna go through some of the major wine uh, growing regions in Italy. And we're gonna talk about the grape varieties that are used there and the famous wines that are coming from these areas. But the one thing I love about Italy is this. It is just without a doubt, the most beautiful country in the world. It has huge uh, tourism coming to Italy because it's just really, really beautiful. There is these beautiful vistas of these old villas, you know, beautiful vineyards. Um, it's really a wonderful country to, to visit. And again, someone from each of your campuses is going to come visit with me to Italy in uh, October, September, October next year. So let's pay attention work hard, study, make your attendance is good. Attendance is easy now because you can do it all from home. Uh, so let's look at the main grape varieties. Um, and again, Italy, as I mentioned, has more than 1,000 different grape varieties. In fact, I think the number is, the actual number of grape varieties is about 640 some. But of those 640 different grape varieties, there's different names for some of these grape varieties depending on the region. Again, we've got over 20 different regions within Italy. And within each of these regions, sometimes one particular grape variety has different names. So that's why it's really complicated to understand that. But let's just focus on three black grapes and three white grapes. These are the main grapes, most famous grapes in Italy. For black grapes, we have Nebbiolo, Barbera, and Sangiovese. And these grapes are sort of associated with particular regions. For example, Nebbiolo is the very, very full-bodied, intense grape producing a Barolo and Barbaresco. And Barolo and Barbaresco are specifically coming from the region of Fademont. 
And this is the region, Barolo, that we're going to visit on the wine tour next year. Barbera, very famous grape in Italy, but it's a little more lighter in style. It's not as big and robust as, as the Nebbiolo. And then we have Sangiovese, and Sangiovese is the main grape of Tuscany. Um, it is the grape of Chianti, and it is the grape of Brunello di Montalcino, which are the two main grapes in Italy. And again, when we're dealing with the old world, we have place name wines. For example, Chianti is a wine. Chianti is also a region. So this is where we have the styles of wines that are named after the regions. Understanding the history of these particular areas and the, the wine that is made there, then we have to understand the grape variety. So for example, Chianti is primarily made with Sangiovese. Barolo, Barbaresco are all made with Nebbiolo. So old world place name wines, new world, we see the grape varieties on the label. For example, Sula Cabernet, Sula Chardonnay. White grapes, Vino Grigio, Garganaga, and Cortese. Pino Grigio is kind of the exception of the rule when it comes to place names. Pinot Grigio has become extremely popular all around the world. So we do see now Pinot Grigio as a grape variety on the label. <clears throat> Where Garganaga is the grape of Suave. Suave is a region within uh, Veneto. And Veneto is where we went on the wine tour last year. And it is made 100% Garganaga, which is a lovely, lovely wine. And then Gavi is the wine but Cortese is the grape that is used there. So I don't expect you to remember the thousand different grapes produced in Italy, but you should know the three major black grapes and the three major white grapes. You should know the region that they are produced in and you should know the, the name of the wine that is made from these particular grape varieties. Like France, Italy and most major wine producing areas have quality classifications. These are classifications that are written right on the labels. And the reason we have these is so as a consumer, we can better understand the quality levels of the wine just by looking at the label. So in Italy, we have VDT, which is Vino da Tavola, IGT, which is Indicazione Geografica Tipica. DOC, Denominazione de Origine Controllata, and then DOCG, which is Denominazione de Origine Controllata Garantita. Okay, so that's a lot of Italian words that are kind of fun to say. Um, but let's look at each one of those. And again, whenever we look at a pyramid graph on something, at the bottom of the pyramid typically is a larger production, but the quality level is low. And as you go up the pyramid, production becomes less, but the quality becomes higher. And this is typical here. So if you're seeing VDT or Vino da Tavola, this is a very simple wine, very easy drinking, not very expensive. But if you're seeing a DOCG wine, then this is a much more expensive, a little more complicated, a little more interesting wine. So let's look at each one. VDT, table wine, it's a basic wine. Uh, this, most of the VDT, Vino de Tavola, this is the wine that is consumed in Italy by Italian. Uh, and again, you can buy a nice bottle of Vino de Tavola for maybe 75 rupees. So not so expensive. Keeping in mind that the average Italian drinks about 45 bottles of wine per year. He's not spending, you know, like if you wanted to buy a nice bottle of wine in India, we'd be spending two to 3,000 rupees. He's not spending that for his bottle of wine. He's spending 75 rupees for a bottle of wine. He'll maybe ha drink half of it at lunch and he'll leave the other half on the table and not worry about it and he'll go off to work. So really, Vino de Tavola, very simple, very affordable, Nice wine, but nothing too complex. <clears throat> IGT, this is reserved for uh, 
basically it's wine coming from a particular area, but it was created as a designation for the Super Tuscans, um, which we're gonna get into in a little bit. And Super Tuscans are a wine style that was made in Tuscany around the 70s that focused on French grape varieties, um, but being produced in Italy. DOC is now, this is a controlled designation of, of origin. So DOC is now referring to a particular area. For example, Chianti is a DOC, Chianti DOC. And in Chianti, DOC has rules and regulations about how the wine can be made, how the grapes can be grown, and the type of grape varieties that can be used. So for, to think of it in another way, think of it as a recipe. So the DOC of Chianti is a recipe that is different from other areas like Brunello di Montalcino or Barolo. Barolo is also a DOC. It has its own recipe, grape varieties that can be used, how the wine can be made. And at the top of the pyramid is the DOCG, which basically is everything in the DOC, controlled area, has to be within a particular region, has a particular recipe how the wine is made, but it has Garantita. So what happens now is that the, the winery, they make a really nice wine following all the rules and regulations of their particular area. And they think they make a really nice bottle of wine. So they now give this bottle to a control board. It's a government agency. And at this government agency that will take the bottle, they'll do a chemical analysis to make sure that everything in the wine is good much like in FSSI in India. Remember when they did the chemical analysis of Maggie noodles and they found all that bad stuff in the Maggie noodles, but everyone still eats the Maggie noodles because they taste so good. Same thing happens there. They do a chemical analysis, but then they also do a tasting. So there's actually a group of people that sit around a table and they taste wine. And if they think this wine reaches a particular quality level, they'll give it the garantita. So that's this stamp of approval that this is a good one. This is the highest level of the classification. So 20 Italian wine regions. Alsta Valley, Piemonte, Lugaria, Lombardy, Trentino, Friuli, Veneto, Emilia Romano, Toscana, Marche, Umbria, Lazio, Sardinia, Abruzzo, Molise, Campania, Basilicata, Apulia, Calabria, and Sicily. So a lot of areas. So again, we're not gonna go into each and every one of these areas, but I love saying them because the Italian language is really beautiful. Some really nice words there. So we're going to talk about a few of the major wine regions. <clears throat> Piedmont, or you can also pronounce it the way the Italians pronounce it, Piemonte. And if you can see here, Piemonte is up here at the very top of Italy, really close, shares the border into France. And Piemonte is an area that we're going to visit on the wine tour uh, next year. The best, the most famous wines from the Piemonte region are the Barolo and Barbaresco. And again, these are all made from the Nebbiolo grape. And these wines are very, very good, but they're also made to age. Barolo wines, you'll, the Barolo wines will be released after they've been made from one harvest, maybe three years later after they've been aging it in oak barrels a bit in the bottle, and then they will get it. But Barolo wines are actually wines that are meant to age. So ideally, if you can wait 10 years before you open a bottle of Barolo, the wine has now had a chance to age and become a little more complex and a little more interesting. Most wines that are produced, I would say about 80% of all the wines that are made in the world are made to be consumed as soon as they're sold. 
So when they get to the wine shop, you buy it, you take it home, you can drink it. But there is a, about 20% of the wines in the world that are made that actually need a little time to evolve and become a little more interesting. And Barolo and Barbaresco, these are wines that are actually made to be aged uh, before they're consumed. Other popular grape varieties that we're gonna see in Fademont other than Nebbiolo are Barbera and Dolcetto. And Barbera just is a little, um, Nebbiolo is very big, intense, complex grape, where Barbera is a little lighter, a little more easy drinking. Uh, it, it can be consumed a little bit younger than the uh, Nebbiolo can. Wines made from Barbera, as I said, are often more fruity and delicate in their style. They have less tannins uh, than wine made from the Nebbiolo. Uh, Dolcetto, though, on the other side, this grape gives a fresh, uh, dry red wine that has some tannin. So there's some diversity of the wines that are produced there. And they also make a really famous sparkling wine from the Muscato grape, and it's called Asti Spamanti. It's actually a very inexpensive sparkling wine. For example, a bottle of champagne is gonna cost you around six to 8,000 rupees. You can get a nice bottle of Asti Spamanti for maybe 1,500 rupees. So it's a lot less expensive. Um, and when we get into actually sparkling wine production, you're gonna see why uh, champagne is more expensive, just what goes into it, and why Asti Spamanti is a little more uh, simple and, and less expensive to use. I don't know if you've done, have you had sparkling wine yet? I don't think Peter's done that for you. I'm not sure if we've done that yet. Uh, no, I think as of now, Mr. Edgar, uh, they have not done it so far. Okay, so that'll be coming up. Uh, okay. Ligeria is another famous region in uh, Italy. It is right here along the coast, right above Tuscany, between Piedmont and Tuscany. As you can see, it's very coastal. It's not a, a big area, it's very coastal. Um, these are along the Italian Riviera and it's actually very famous because the Cinque Terre, I don't know if you've ever heard about uh, tourist places in Italy, but there's a very, very famous area called Cinque Terre. And it's basically, Cinque is five. So there's five villages that are all along the coast of the Riviera. And you can actually hike all the way along this coast to all of the five different uh, villages. Very, very beautiful. Uh, very, very famous place to go. Not inexpensive, so if you are gonna go bring your uh, credit card. Um, but here they actually produce a, a selection of primarily white wines. Um, Vermentino is a white grape variety. And again, if you think about this region because it hugs the coast of Italy, if you think about even a hundred years or, uh, ago or more, most of the, the food that we consumed was food that was readily available for us. We didn't have refrigerated trucks. We didn't have frozen things. So you always had the fresh food that was available. And if we go back to the coast here, what do you think these people are eating there? Yeah, they're all, most of the food that they're getting is coming from the sea, a lot of fish, seafood. So the wines that are being produced for that particular area are being produced because it benefits the food that is being produced. And white wine just goes better with fresh fish and seafood than a red wine would go. So these light white wines um, are very popular there. And then in the West, uh, a little bit further in, we do get a little bit of uh, red wine being produced. But primarily in this area, we're getting some really beautiful white wines there. Lombardi, which is here, is uh, North Central Italy. Uh, 
It is a region that is known particularly for its sparkling wines. Lombardy produces also still red, white, and rosé wines made from a variety of uh, local grape varieties. They produce a lot of wine in this area. They produce about 28 million gallons of wine, which is more than Friuli, Marche, and Trentino, and Umbria together. So really huge amount of wine production going on in Lombardy. Friuli is up here, and this is very, very close to uh, Germany and Switzerland. So the wines are going to be a little bit more represented of the wines that we're going to find from Germany and Switzerland. Uh, this is in northeastern Italy. Not only is it fairly far north, it is also quite high in elevation because we're getting into the mountains there. Uh, and again, we have this noticeable Slavic Germanic influence to the wine. Um, primarily known for its white wines. And again, in this particular area, because we are going further north, we're also getting higher in elevation. It's cooler up there. And again, white grapes grow better in cooler climates. So this is why this area is, is, is known for its white wines. And as far as um, the amount of high quality designation, DOCG and DOC wines, uh, uh, um, this area, a lot of them in Piedmont, which are the other two. So these three particular regions are known for producing very, very high quality wines. Veneto. Veneto is here, and Veneto is where we went on the wine tour last year. Beautiful area. This is home to Venice, where we went to visit. And Veneto is actually quite diverse in its style of wines. It has some very famous red wines, but it also has some very famous white wines. It is home to the famous white wine, Suave. And again, we talked about the top three white grape varieties, Garganaga. This is the grape of Suave, produces beautiful, uh, very complex, interesting wine. The cooler areas, uh, slightly higher in elevation in this area is, is where we're going to find our, our Garganaga. But we also have the very famous Valpolicella, Amarone, and Bardellino. These are red wines which are very famous. And Amarone is actually a very unique wine because in Amarone, the grapes that they use, they pick them when they're, when they're ripe on the harvest, but they don't make wine from them right away. They'll pick these wines and then they'll actually put them on these flat beds, straw, not straw, but um, wooden or plastic beds and they let the grapes dry out a little bit. So by letting them dry out a little bit, they lose about 30 to 40% of the water that is in the grape. They're not getting to raisins yet, but they're just slowly starting to contract. And what's happening is because we're reducing the amount of water that's in the grape, we're getting a little bit more concentration and intensity of the flavors. So once these grapes have reduced in, in, in moisture by about a third, they now take these grapes, they'll press them and they'll make wine from them. And it just makes for a very, very intense, robust, um, spicy, concentrated wine. It tends to have a little bit higher alcohol content as well because of the, the concentrations of the sugars. Um, beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, And in Veneto, it's actually, they're quite modern in their approach to making wine. In a lot of areas in Italy, they've been making wine for the same way, uh, the same methods for hundreds of years without changing. But in Veneto, um, they're, they're quite modern in their approach to making wine and they're open to new and modern approaches in making wine which is not really the case in Italy. Italy is very, very, very conservative. 
uh, when it comes to traditionally making wine. <clears throat> so Veneto is also a little bit famous for experimenting with French grape varieties, Cabernet, Chardonnay, and uh, Pinot Noir methods as well. So in Veneto, we're going to find these traditional uh, wines like Suave and uh, Amarone, but you'll also start to see a little bit of wines being produced from the French grape varieties, Cabernet, Merlot. Uh, 8,500 hectoliters of wine, that's a lot of wine being produced there. Uh, white wine accounts for about 55% of all the wine that's being produced in Veneto. Tuscany, right in the center of Italy, we have coastal exposure and then we have internal exposure. Coastal exposure is going to give us a little more cooling uh, treatment coming off the sea. These coastal vineyards where we're going to find more white wine production. In the center, where it gets a little warmer, a little hotter, we're going to see more of the red wine um, being produced there. And Tuscany is without a doubt the most famous wine region in all of Italy. Um, it is home to Chianti and Brunello di Montalcino. Both of these wines are primarily made from Sangiovese. Uh, Chianti typically has anywhere between 70% and 90% Sangiovese with some other grapes blended in. Brunello di Montalcino is made 100% of Sangiovese. Tuscany also makes a really, really beautiful dessert wine called Vinsanto. And with Vinsanto production, uh, it's a little bit on the lines of the Amarone, where they take the grapes and they let them dry out. But instead of losing about a third of the moisture in the grapes, they will leave them to dry for months and months and months, much longer than in Amarone to get a much, much uh, higher concentration of the grape. Uh, and they'll actually hang them. They'll hang them in, uh, on strings, on ropes, in the lofts, the higher part of the, uh, the winery where the hot air rises and it actually really helps to dry out these grapes. And then they'll, they'll squeeze these almost raisin and so you're getting a very, very concentrated grape juice. And with this grape juice, they're going to make uh, the sweet wines of Vinsanto. Beautiful, beautiful wine. Um, and in the 1970s, Tuscany uh, has been famous for its production of Super Tuscan. And Super Tuscans are wines that were made originally out of the DOC and the DOCG rules and regulations because in DOC and DOCG, in the recipe that was allowed there, only was allowed these Italian grape varieties, where the super Tuscan wines were made from French grape varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc. So these wines weren't really allowed to be called these high designations of DOCG and DOC. But these, wines, what was happening was the, in Tuscany, they were producing wines primarily with the Sangiovese. And earlier, especially in the 50s and 60s, they were making a very rustic, very simple wine from Sangiovese. It wasn't really that sophisticated a wine at the time. <clears throat> and there was a, a movement, there was just a, a handful of families that uh, one in particular, who this gentleman had actually was related to, he was royalty in Italy, and he was related to some of the families that had wineries in Bordeaux, the Rothschild families and these, uh, these Grand Cru wineries in Bordeaux that primarily grow Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot. And when he would, he would often visit these wineries and taste these beautiful wines made from Cabernet, and he really got to appreciate them. But then when he would go back to Italy, and he would drink some of the local wines, he found them to be quite simple. So he'd found an area in Tuscany along the coast where he thought these, this vineyard actually 
kind of reminded him of the vineyards of Bordeaux. It had these large stones or these pebbles, which is kind of specific of the, of the, the Puyac region of Bordeaux. So he thought maybe I can start to grow some Cabernet Sauvignon here because I really don't like the Sangiovese that much. So he actually got some vines uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon and he planted them in this vineyard in Tuscany. And he made this wine that was primarily used for himself and his family. Um, and for a number of years, he would make his own wine that he would drink because he didn't like the local wine. And the, the winery, he ended up calling it Sasakaya. And Sasakaya means a field of many stones. And Sasakaya is now the most famous. And this is the wine that I was hoping that someone would find. And we'll see if they've been able to find it and send it to me. Um, that was the first <clears throat> famous super Tuscan wine made primarily with French grapes, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon. And after he had many friends come and visit and they would bring out this, this wine, the Sasakai for people to try. And people were saying, wow, this is really tasty. This is really, really nice wine. So he started to make more and more of it and got to the point that he actually made too much wine that he could, couldn't consume it all himself. So he went to his friends, which were the Antonori's, and he said, can you help me sell this wine? People think it's really good. Uh, and they said, fine, fine, we'll help you. And they ended up selling it. And it became, uh, it was awarded the best wine in the world in, I think, 1986. A wine spectator designated this wine as the best wine in the world. And that was sort of the recognition of French grapes that were being grown in Italy and became uh, very, very good. So that's kind of the history there. But that area in Tuscany, which is along the coast where he's growing this, where Sasakaya is, is called Bulgari. So Bulgari is the region. So let's see who was able to get that. Abruzzo. Abruzzo is down here. Again, it's on the, the Adriatic side. Abruzzo, it's quite rugged. It's very mountainous as you get that far down in Italy. 42 million cases of wine are being produced here. Um, it's the fifth largest producer of wine in all of Italy. But the majority of the wine that is produced down here is very, very simple wine. It's bulk wine, mass produced, very inexpensive, um, quite simple wine. Calabria is down here, very at the very, very bottom of the of Italy. Calabria, uh, again, very hot down there. So we're seeing primarily a black grape varieties growing. So about 90% of the wine produced there is, is red wine. This is a very rural part of Italy. Um, it's very industrialized. Very, very, very low, low income level produced there. But from this particular area, especially after World War II, the, the economy in Italy became very bad after World War II. Um, and a lot of the people that were living in this area, this was the poor, one of the poorest areas in all of Italy, there wasn't really any jobs to be had and any business to be done. So what happened after World War II, there was a lot of Italians that left this particular area and they emigrated to the United States and they emigrated to Argentina. And these people were the beginning of the wine industry in the United States and in Argentina. So they took the winemaking methods, they took some of the grape varieties that were growing in that area and they took them with them when they went to the United States and when they went to Argentina. So this area, not so famous for the wines that are being made there, but it's quite famous for the fact that the people that lived there left Italy, traveled into other countries and were introducing more wine production methods in these other countries. Sicily. Sicily is one of my favorite uh, areas. We visited Sicily on the wine tour. Um, it's quite a very special area. It's at the very bottom again, off the coast. It's an island 
And because it, it's quite warm down there because it's quite far south. But what happens in Sicily is because you've got the sea on all sides, you're getting lots of breezes that are coming in and are cooling down the vineyards. So they're not so intensely hot as they would be if it was just, if it was more inland. And Sicily, major cities there is Palermo, Catania. Palermo is where we went. This is where we, we stayed when we were there. And we went to visit the area of Marsala. And uh, Marsala is famous for its uh, sweet dessert wine that is produced there. So vines have been grown in Sicily for somewhere between two and a half and 4,000 years. It is one of the earliest, earliest wine production methods in all of the Mediterranean. Sicily has a lot of influence, not just from Italy, but also from the, uh, the other side of the Mediterranean that influenced the, the wine styles and the grapes and stuff that will be growing there. It is the largest island in the Mediterranean Sea, has a great variety of vineyards there. Um, many, many high quality wines are being produced there. And actually Sicily is producing some of the new sexy wines coming out of Italy. Some of the most desirable and famous wines coming out of Italy are now coming from Sicily. People, there's a, there's a big, big demand now for Sicilian wines. And it's the, again, Marsala is a wine that has been produced there for a long, long time. And it's sort of made a, a Sicily famous, but it's not just the Marsala wine. And again, Marsala is famous for, uh, for uh, as a wine that is used in recipes for cooking, veal Marsala, chicken Marsala, uh, but it's actually a beautiful wine. And it has its own indigenous grape variety, which is quite famous, uh, Nero de, de Avola, which is there. So these are sort of the, the main areas of Italy that we've discussed. Um, and again, I can't explain to you how beautiful and how wonderful it is to visit Italy. So I've actually put together a few pictures uh, for you to see of if you ever want to visit Italy. And this is actually a winery that, uh, that uh, we have visited in the past on the wine tour. Um, this is the old house. This is the road that leads up to it. Um, just beautiful. The, the, the vistas and the, the vineyards of, of Italy are just so amazing. We visited this winery called Tenuta de Valgiano. She does biodynamic wines. She's right here. This is her villa that we, we visited. We came, this is friends of ours. There was about a group of us, about 15. And we had a beautiful lunch that she made for us. So those of you who make it on the wine tour, maybe we can visit a nice place. They'll make a nice lunch for us. Drink some wine, sit around the table. This is Laura, she's the owner of the winery there. This is what happens when you go to visit wineries in Italy. You get to meet them, you sit down with them, you have dinner with them. Sitting here, see the beautiful vistas that we have in the background there. You might see some famous faces soon, we get to them. Who's that guy? John Kenworthy and Pinky. They were with us when we went to visit. Tasting the wine. This is actually one of her Vincentos. This is the sweet wine she has for dessert. These are the wines that she produces. Some of the food we had, Sean in the kitchen. So this is just a little bit about uh, Italy and uh, the food of Italy, the wine of Italy and the people of Italy. It's, it's quite lovely. So with that, uh, can we see if we have any questions from the students? Right, Mr. Edgar. Uh, we have a couple of stu students uh, have texted me some questions. Uh, the first one goes, what are the grape varieties added in the making of Chianti and Brunello di Montalcino other than Sangiovese? Okay, well, in Brunello di Montalcino, there are no additional grapes allowed. It is only Sangiovese. And in Chianti, there's a few available to add, 
One is uh, Colorino. Another one is Caneola. There's a couple of other ones in there as well. I don't really uh, remember them exactly now. But Colorino is added because Colorino is actually very, very dark in color. And it's often added just to give a sort of a, a, a depth of color to the wine. Um, so those are two of the grapes that can be added. There are, there's a, a few other ones in there. I just don't specifically know all of them, but those are two that I know. But primarily in Chianti, uh, for example, in Chianti Classico, which is a smaller subregion within Chianti, you need to have a minimum of 80% uh, Sangiovese. Uh, in Chianti, the larger region, you need to have a minimum of 70%, and then the other grapes can be added. Okay, right. The next question it goes, um, what is meant by super Tuscan wine? So like how they are designated and recognized in the wine laws of Italy? Okay, so super Tuscan is not designated by rules and regulation. Super Tuscan is more the term given to these um, wines that were made in Tuscany not with the Italian grape varieties, but with the French grape variety. So there's no uh, legal uh, definition when it comes to Super Tuscan. It's more about the, 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 the fame of that particular wine. And again, the reason why they call it Super Tuscans is because these were really excellent wines that were being produced in Tuscany, but not with the native grape varieties of Sangiovese. But what we are seeing in super Tuscan wines is <clears throat> because the, the Italians are actually quite proud of their, of their, of their country, their wines, etc. cetera. So what, although the original super Tuscan, the Sasakaya, was made only with French grape varieties, this category of super Tuscan wines now has um, Cabernet, Merlot, most often is now blended with Sangiovese, the local grape variety. So the super Tuscan wines have now become French grapes blended with the, the classic grape of Tuscany, Sangiovese. Right, uh, Mr. Edgar. Uh, next, uh, one of the students would like to know about the unique feature of uh, Val Policella. You know, what, what, is, what is the speciality of the Val Policella wine? Well, Valpolicello, again, coming from Veneto, and Valpolicello tends to be a little, uh, a little more fruity, uh, a little more lush wine than the other grapes up there, which is the Amarone, or the other ones, the Amarone. Um, so yes, so it's just a little bit more fruity, a little more uh, approachable wine. Okay, right. Um... Next question, uh, one of the students would like to know, what is the average aging period of Chianti? <clears throat> well, Chianti, it's, again, there's different quality levels within Chianti. There's Chianti, which is wine coming from the larger region of Chianti. And that wine, I believe, only has to be aged not even a year before it can be sold. Chianti Classico, uh, that has, I think, a minimum of one year. And then within Chianti Classico, we also have Chianti Classico Reserva. And Chianti Classico Reserva has to be aged for two years before it can be sold. So again, there's different quality levels within Chianti. And with each one of those, the, the aging period is different. Uh. Right, Mr. Edgar. Uh, another question coming up to me uh, is how Sassic uh, wine is different from the other regular wines of Italy. Uh, as uh, it was told, uh, Sassic, the wine is made from Cabernet Sauvignon, which is uh, from the French origin. So how this wine I'm is I'm sorry, different. can you repeat? You're breaking up. Okay, am I audible? Yes, hello. Hello. I'm, I need Hello. to. Yeah. Am yeah. I audible right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, you're Mr. fine now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, fine. One of the students would like to know how is Sassicchia wine is uh, different from the other regular wines of Italy? And as it's made from Cabernet Sauvignon, which is from the French origin, 
how that texture is different from the regular Italian wines. Well, it's, again, one of the biggest differences that we can do to make a wine taste different is by the grape varieties that we use. And again, let's go back to understanding how grape varieties are different by understanding how mangoes are different. Again, do all mangoes taste the same? No. Do all mangoes look the same, smell the same, have the same fragrance? No. Do you love all different varieties of mangoes? Maybe not. Maybe there's particular grape varieties or, or mango varieties that you prefer. It's the same thing with grapes. They're just different. But what they found with Sasakaya was how, for example, Cabernet Sauvignon that is grown in Bordeaux has a particular style to it because of the terroir influences of Bordeaux. But take Cabernet Sauvignon and grow it in Tuscany and it has its own unique character. Um, and they just found that the French grape varieties that they were growing in the Bulgaria area of Tuscany were just really great. The way they, the, the, way the grapes grew um, and, the, and the wine that was made from them, the flavors and aromas of the wine was quite lovely. So it's just about getting the right grape variety in the right terroir situation. Um, and that's just how, but it was, a, it was kind of a bold idea to be able to, to do a French run. And again, the French and the Italians really didn't get along. And I think to this point, really don't get along that either. So the even an Italian really they have their own grapes. The French are French, they have their own grapes. So to do a French grape in an Italian vineyard was quite new to do that. Um, but yeah, it's just getting the right terroir influences on a particular grape variety. And it just grew really well and it just made a very, very good wine. Right, Mr. Edgar, we come to the last question of the day. Uh, session uh, that's uh, what is the basic difference of the soil texture which is found in the coastal area of Italy versus the hilly mountain region of Italy so what's the difference of the soil okay soil differences may not be so different to the grape variety uh, or the growing of the grape you will see that and if you can imagine if you for example where Bulgaria is which is very near the coast there's a lot of sand in the soil where if you go up into the mountains, you're going to get a lot more stones and granite and, and those sorts of things. What influences more uh, the grape growing in these areas closer to the coast than further inland and in the mountains has more to do with temperature. So again, the cooling breezes that are coming in off the sea are going to affect the grapes more um, than grapes that are grown further inland. So it's not so much the soil as to the, the temperature. Right, right, Mr. Edgar. I think probably we have already, uh, uh, you have already answered all of our students' queries so far. I'm sure probably they don't have anything further to know. And uh, we would really love to have the, uh, the presentation from your end and probably just probably send it to Mr. Bhaskar Sankrupta. That yeah, I'll really send both of them. I'll, share I'll, it with I'll, our students. Yeah, I'll send the Italian and I'll send the French one as well. Those are all complete. Right, right. Thank you so much, Mr. Edgar, for your time. Okay. I'm sure the students must Great. have loved this session. And we look forward to connect once again. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank Study you. Hard. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, students. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye.